Ezra Pound Speaking, Radio Speeches of World War II by Ezra Pound. Edited by Leonard W. Doob. Number 11, February 19, 1942, U.S.A. 77. Power. The President Hath Power. This is an original broadcast recording. Closed captions are source text. The Italian radio, opinion by those who are qualified to hold it, following the tradition of Italian hospitality, has offered Dr. Ezra Pound the use of the microphone to those against his conscience or anything incompatible with his duties as a citizen of the United States of America. and sign the nation's name on the document. The United States treaties are valid when ratified by the Senate and not the floor. The President has no legal power to enter into condominiums with foreign governments for the misconduct of scandalous islands off the China coast President has no more legal right to do these infamies than you have to sign my name on a check or I yours. There is no darkness save ignorance. The labor, that is to say the slidy and weak memory of past events, is no asset to a nation or statesman. Looking back to an unsavory part of our American past, we find it more savory than the present. Whether Roosevelt has mental stamina enough left to learn anything from his nasty forerunner and foreslider, Woodrow the card face, I knew not. But men of mental capacity, any man of a mental capacity above that of a war hog, or to be able to look back as far as 1914 and 1919. <coughs> Woodrow resisted clamor to get the United States into that war. When he came in, he was in accord with the will of the people, a will which he had not faith or concocted. The Allies won that war and then cheated Italy. That was an error. The cheating of Italy was an error, and Lloyd George ought to know it back. No. The cheating of Italy was an error. And then Wilson further signed or tried to sign the United States name to a rascally agreement. When he did that, he was not expressing the will of a nation. He had a and wriggled out of the proper functions of his office, knowing that he opposed the will of the people. There is a limit or orbit to power. There is a limit or orbit to the practical effects of illegality. Well, our old codfree sawfoot was his own, but he was a petted. In fact, he was bothered to rest, inoculated, and laid down the garden path by his accomplices. And they were warned. And even had they not been warned, it was their duty to ascertain what Woodrow's real powers were. The position of the Warbirds and Lloyd George at Versailles of crooks who accept a forged check in the hope of passing it on to someone else. The dirt and grease of the Versailles scoundrels, subdued and gentle. 
Gentiles alike, was that to help you, Dr. Wilson, having passed him off on the brutalized and stupefied people as if he were the United States, they proceeded to offer his forged check to their people. To their people. The League of Nations thanked him. And to their people. The League of Nations sank from the beginning. It sank of the Bank of Basel, the Warburg, the Regents of the Bank, the Cross, and the Ulster of England. Now, not all Roosevelt's actions are infamous. Not all his actions. As there is no criticism of music, you can judge the relative merits of works by the same composer. So there is no political or ethical criticism. Here you can measure and judge the different political acts of the same political criminal, gangster, or statesman. When the president acts within his powers, he has no need to do violence to the laws. His powers are executive. That is, he is legally there to put into effect the will of the nation and the laws made by the representatives of the people. When he violates and passes beyond his legal powers, he acts toward the destruction of all legal government of the United States, all government by law and by the laws. I mean by any law. He moves toward total illegality. This is evil. This is extremely dangerous in the long run. It is myopic. It is short-sighted. In fact, a man is a man. No good American objects to the United States of America assuring the tranquility of the Caribbean. There is no need to violate the mandate of the people in making quite sure that there be no submarine bases, poison factories, etc., immediately off the coast of Florida or in easy reach of Georgia, Alabama, and the mouth of the Mississippi. There are even ways. One can offer to buy, even if one thinks one will have to take over and make reparations later. I do not think Congress would have objected to take it over all Guyana, not merely the goddamn Dutch part. When a politician's whole policy has been indirect, when his political strategy has consisted in indirectness, in the carom shot, not the straight shot, it is unwise to accept any act of his at its face value. If Rooster's aim had been Dutch Guiana, he would probably have turned public attention elsewhere. And it is reasonable to assume, on the basis of Rooster's public career since the end of his second year in the White House, the end of his second year, that his aim in this case was not Dutch Guiana. It is legitimate at least to suspect that his main purpose was to grab the yet more illegal power, to put a hot one over such fools as Senator Pepper and the other boobs in the Senate and Congress. Like balloon-faced, bombustious Churchill, Roosevelt follows every era with a demand for more personal power. We should be very careful in arriving at a judgment of his Caribbean policy. It may be another mere grab. His interest in internal politics is considerable. His heat and loathing of legitimate action, of reasoned action, is extreme. His intolerance of all real collaboration either is or ought to be known to men who share the responsibility for governing the United States of America. I should desire an open mind in considering the Caribbean policy, which is okay.
insofar as it aims at peace and security. And the question of how far Brazil, Brazil, should agree in our ideas of peace and security is a hemisphere question. All this is a matter of the American hemisphere. As I said in opening, we will have no criticism of our own politics, no criticism of the name, till we can judge between one act of a blousy rhinoceros and another. The policy for the Western Hemisphere is one thing, Asian affairs are another. England's conduct in China has been, for the most part, an infamy. Let some bloody-minded betrayer of the British people get up in their grimy assembly and tell the world of their kind acts in the Orient. From the sacking of the Imperial Palace in Pekin to the Chusun's Sassoon's century of infamy and opium, with Robert Cecil, their advocate. That is their dirt, why make it ours? In any case, secret agreements between a usurious nature baker, whether in or out of the White House, are illegal. And the foreign government, which presents these secret pledges to its people as if they were acts of the United States of America, participates and naturally has participated in the swindle. We should leave this track trash to its own people. If this people hasn't the manhood and sense to spew out their Churchills, Baldwins, Buckins, and lesser vermin, that is their own affair, and they will presumably pay the penalty for their own flaccidity and mistaken tolerance. They will slang us for their errors. All right. But that any sub-Jew in the White House should send American lads to die for the jew tunes and Sassoons and the private interests of the scum of the English earth and the still lower dregs of the Parsi and Levantine importations is an outrage. And that ends it. To send boys from Omaha to Singapore to die for British monopoly and brutality is not the act of an American patriot. Is the bomb speaking? You have just had a talk by Andrew Pound entitled Power. This is the Italian Broadcasting System transmitting the third daily program for North America. We now present a concert of opera selection. Please listen to the introduction to the opera, The Vesto, by Spontini. End of number 11, Power, the President Hath Power. Ezra Pound speaking, radio speeches of World War II.